Greetings, motherfuckers, and welcome to this week's edition of 101 Facts. My name, as always, is Sam, and today we're here to dance across the galaxy with both a furry and a metallic friend of mine. No, not these very obviously stock footage chaps who may or may not appear again later. I'm talking about Ratchet and Clank, of course, the gadget and weapon fiends who are almost always saving the universe, soon to be coming back in their new game, Rift Apart. Good lads. But doing what makes which body parts of an NPC randomly grow? Which weapon was made by a fan as part of a contest? And why haven't they released a collection of real-life clanks yet? I could really do the little robot pal who can make me fly and listen to my problems. Two out of three of those questions are going to be answered, so pack those magnetic boots and be prepared for an innuendo or two with 101 facts about Ratchet and Clank. Number one. So Ratchet and Clank, in case you clicked on this video without a clue about what those are, let me make like Craig David and fill you in. Ratchet and Clank is a video game series which made its debut all the way back in 2002. Number two. The games are third-person action adventures which follow the escapades of Ratchet and Clank, a duo who travel through the universe saving it repeatedly from various evils. We should thank them, really. Number three. There are 16 games in the Ratchet and Clank video game series, with the 17th installment coming in the very near future, but hey, that's skipping ahead. Let's go back to the very beginning. Number four. When Ratchet and Clank was conceptualised all the way back in 2001, it looked incredibly different to what we know now. In fact, it was codenamed Girl with a Stick, and was kind of a mashup between Zelda and Tomb Raider. Number 5. As catchy as that name was, the studio head Ted Price decided to can it, and work instead on the generic idea of an alien that travels from planet to planet collecting weapons and gadgets. Number 6. That idea went down a lot better, and after a few dodgy designs, the first concept drawings for Ratchet were created. Price called Ratchet species a Lombax, a race of feline humanoid aliens that are great engineers and warriors. Number 7. Before he became more feline in appearance, he was originally designed as more reptilian and later as a furry caveman with a club, which would eventually become Ratchet's OmniWrench 8000. Number 8. Of course, around this time, they also designed Clank with the idea of having an intergalactic buddy cop game, like Lethal Weapon crossed with a kid's cartoon, which, you know, they kind of nailed that. Number 9. Before Clank became Clank, though, he was imagined as multiple robots within Ratchet's backpack, with each one having a different function. Unsurprisingly, that would have been far more complicated and messy, so the many robots became Clank, and Clank was worn as a backpack instead of having a literal backpack. Number 10. Much like Ratchet, Clank was also quite reptilian looking in his initial conception. He had enormous red eyes and two giant cannons on his back. They kept the larger eyes but scrapped the cannons. For now. Number 11. We should probably mention the developers of Ratchet and Clank are none other than Insomniac Games, also known as the incredible folk that created Spider-Man PS4 and Miles Morales, the Spyro games and the Resistance series, if anyone remembers that. Number 12. Once the Insomniac team had solidified the idea of Ratchet and Clank, they had to get Sony to finance it. However, those Insomniacs didn't actually have an engine to run the demo on, so they kind of faked it. Number 13. It was more that they didn't have the engine to cope with their big ideas, so without an engine they presented dioramas that looked like a real game, and the Sony peeps, they ate it right up. Number 14. There was still the issue of getting a working engine though. Luckily, Andrew Price was good pals with Jason Rubin, who happened to be one of the co-founders of Naughty Dog, that other Sony games developer famous for Crash Bandicoot and later the Uncharted and Last of Us games. Number 15. The two companies also just happened to share offices in the Universal Interactive backlot, which sounds like a lot of fun to be honest. Those two sharing an office, I mean, not the back lot. But pals being pals, Rubin donated the game engine from Jack and Daxter for Ratchet and Clank, with the understanding that any improvements and adjustments they made would be shared so they could both have the same tech. Number 16. During development of the game, there were apparently around 70 invented weapons, each as ridiculous as the last, including the Morpho Ray, which turned enemies into chickens, and the Rhino, which stands for Rip Ya A New One. Number 17. The first Ratchet & Clank game was released in November 2002 on the PlayStation 2, before later being released on the PlayStation 3 and Vita when they came about. It was only 2002, the PlayStation 2 was all we had. What do you mean Xbox? What's that? Number 18. Being financed and published by Sony, it shouldn't be too surprising that like its predecessor Spyro and all other Insomniac games, it was exclusive to PlayStation consoles. Sorry PC Master Race, you weren't getting this one. Number 19. The game reached greatest hit status, which meant it sold over 1 million copies. In fact, by 2006, it sold 4 million. 
It's also the only Western game to be part of a PlayStation 2 bundle in Japan. They bloody loved it over there, they did. They really did. Number 20. This is the only game where Ratchet is voiced by Mikey Kelly. From the second game onwards, including the 2016 movie and character appearances, but I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry, Ratchet is voiced by James Arnold Taylor. Number 21. So Ratchet is a Lombax, and the Lombax race come from the planet Fastoon in the Polaris Galaxy. They're incredible engineers and have some of the most advanced technology, including weapons and spaceships, in the entire universe. Number 22, ooh, ooh. Before the events of the first game, the Lombaxes were involved in the Great War against the Kragmite Empire. They were hailed as heroes after they developed the Dimensionator, which sent the Kragmites to another dimension. Pay close attention. Number 23. After finding a Kragmite egg in a mine, the Lombaxes raised it as their own in Vastoon. The egg grew up to become Tachyon, who betrayed the Lombaxes and defeated them with his droid army, which they escaped from using the Dimensionator. Number 24. So Ratchet is seemingly the only Lombax left in the Solana Galaxy, we'll come back to that later. And when the first game begins, Ratchet is on the planet Veldin in the Solana Galaxy, building himself a spaceship, until he realises he needs an ignition system and thus your adventure begins. Number 25. Clank is a robot created by the leader of the Zoni bioenergy race, the Orvus. He's a defective sentry bot from the planet Quartu. He finds an info bot discovering Chairman Drek's plans to extract and destroy the planet Navalis. Number 26. Clank then flees Kuatu and the Zoni, stealing a spaceship that happens to land on Veldin. Here he meets Ratchet and the pair become fast friends. It's called Ratchet and Clank, so, you know, no brownie points for guessing that one. Number 27. So, first game in a nutshell, after the two pals meet, Clank convinces Ratchet to help him find Captain Quark, the galactic hero, not to be confused with the cottage-type cheese. Number 28. Captain Copernicus Leslie Quark is a superhero who we later learn is secretly working for Drek in order to stop Ratchet and Clank from ruining his evil plans. So when our two title characters meet Quark to enlist him in the fight against Drek, it's kind of in vain. Number 29. Speaking of Drek, his first name is Alonzo, lol, and he's a blog from the planet Orkson in the Solana Galaxy. In the 2016 game and movie, we'll get there, Orkson doesn't exist and he actually comes from Quartu. Why? No idea, just go with it. If you know, tell us in the comments. Number 30. As some of you will know, there's an interesting little feature in this game when you meet Starlene, the Rulgarian hoverboard girl. If you keep doing flips and jumps in front of her by pressing R1 and X, her, um, chesticle protuberances will start to enlarge. We all good on the monetization front there? Okay, good. Whew. Number 31. Anyway, Sony was so confident in the success of Ratchet and Clank that they ordered a sequel a whole five months before the first game was even released. Production ongoing Commando began pretty soon afterwards. Number 32. The developers wanted to step up from the first game and incorporated a few more RPG style elements like upgrading weapons and health. They also decided to include Space Combat, which is now the name of my new band. Number 33. They also made the different planets spherical, which meant changing more than 50,000 lines of coding in the game. It meant the gravity worked better though, so <laughs> worth it. Number 34. After 10 months of development and the Insomniac team doubling in size from 40 to 80, Going Commando was released in November 2003. In Europe and Australia, it was actually called Locked and Loaded, and in Japan, it was just Ratchet and Clank 2. Keeping it simple. Number 35. Another big difference was the personality of Ratchet. After criticism that he came across a bit too self-centered and arrogant, in the games that followed, he was toned down significantly and made more hashtag humble, rather than the vengeance-fueled hyperactive teenager type. Number 36. Remember how we said that Naughty Dog and Insomniac used to share stuff with each other? Well, as nice nods to their hit games, they'd often feature little easter eggs for each other too. In Going Commando, for example, in Clank's apartment, because he has an apartment apparently, he has a cool poster of Jack and Daxter, the game that RNC's base engine comes from. Number 37. After defeating and killing Chairman Drek in the first game, <laughs> spoiler, whoops, Ratchet and Clank in this game are recruited by Abercrombie Fizzwidget, the CEO of Megacore. Megacore started it as a weapons business, but by going commando, it also has TV shows that crop up now and then. Number 38. Megacore hired the duo, with Ratchet given the role of commando and given the task to find an ex-employee who has stolen a biological experiment called the Protopet. This employee is Angela Cross, as in that's her name. She's not Angela and Cross, she's Angela Cross. Good. Number 39. Angela Cross is another Lombax from the planet Grelbin. She previously worked for Megacore in the genetics division, her job being part of the team to fix the flaws of the Protopet. She left the company and stole the Protopet to stop it from being released. 
Number 40. Why would she do that, you ask? Well, it wasn't tested enough and had violent tendencies, making it kill its owners. So she stole it under the guise of an unknown thief and hid it in her flying lab on the planet Aranos. Number 41. Long story short, our two pals work out that Angela is in the right and they work together to stop Fizz Widget. Except, Fizz Widget is not all he seems to be. Once he stupidly turns the Protopet into a mutant Protopet and Ratchet and Clank have to defeat it, Angela finds the real Fizz Widget locked in a closet. The meaning of life. Turns out Fizz Widget was actually Captain Quark the whole time, having taken Fizz Widget's identity after Quark kind of burned its bridges in the Solana Galaxy. After he's caught out again, he's seen working for Megacore as their test dummy for their gadgets and experiments. Number 43. Going Commando received incredible reviews, with critics noting that the changes to Ratchet's personality and the incorporation of RPG elements made significant improvements to the gameplay. Nice one, lads. Number 44. However, Going Commando wasn't the highest rated game of the series. That achievement goes to the next one, Up Your Arsenal. I'm not kidding by the way, that's genuinely what it was called and it might be the best name ever for a game. Number 45. It was released just a year later in November of 2004 on the PS2, and later on the PS3 in 2012, and the PS Vita in 2014. The PS2 disc actually featured a bonus demo for their fellow PlayStation exclusive Sly 2 Band of Thieves. You can access it by holding L1, L2, R1 and R2 simultaneously. Number 46. Up Your Arsenal was the first Ratchet & Clank game to feature a multiplayer mode. The inclusion of this meant that a few of the single player sections were cut so that developers could meet their deadlines, especially as the controls changed to be more similar to that of a third person shooter. Number 47. This game's the debut of a new villain, Dr. Nefarious. I mean, with a name like that, you're setting him up for evil there, aren't you? Nefarious is a robot scientist who declares war in the Solana galaxy. Number 48. Nefarious is joined by a robot pop star Courtney Gears, and together they want to turn all organic life forms into robots. She even released a song in-game called Robots of the Galaxy as propaganda. Number 49. Obviously our pals Ratchet and Clank aren't too happy about that, and they do their best to stop him, and that's the game basically. However, this time Ratchet and Clank have a third wheel. Number 50. Yep, Quark is back. But this time you're on the same team, as Quark is the only person to have fought Nefarious previously in one. Though when you meet him, he's got a bit of amnesia and thinks he's a tree man and that Ratchet is his leader. It's a... it's a whole thing. Number 51. Quark has minigames within Up Your Arsenal, which reveal the details around his past with Dr. Nefarious. These side-scrollers see him navigate a number of different worlds and face different enemies. Number 52. The best part of these? There's a cheat for each level which changes Quark's outfit to a pink tutu when punched in. You can also access two minigames in the Insomniac Museum, no points for guessing who that's named after, by typing in the codes Megan or Ying Zhu. Number 53. There are also minigames from your allies the Galactic Rangers, who send Ratchet on mini missions to defeat targets or capture bases. These often unlocked new weapons or earned more bolts. Number 52. After Up Your Arsenal came Ratchet Deadlocked, otherwise known as Ratchet Gladiator. You'll notice that there's a lack of clank in the title, and that's because he's not a backpack in this game, he's actually in it a fair bit less. What? Number 55. Deadlocked was released on the PlayStation 2 in October of 2005 in North America, and November of 2005 everywhere else on Earth. It was later released on the PS3 in 2013. Number 56. The game was significantly darker than the first three, with developers taking inspiration from the Halo series. It was originally titled Ratchet & Clank Nexus, and would have seen the main duo deal with a war in which they both had differing opinions. Number 57. Ultimately that game got cancelled, but ideas from these were used in both Dreadlocked and the 2011 game All For One. In this one, the moodier and dark art style definitely stuck, and the idea of battle arenas from Up Your Arsenal became a huge part of the game. Number 58. Deadlocked takes place in the shadow sector of the Solana Galaxy and sees Ratchet kidnapped alongside other heroes in a gladiator-style fight to the death. The captors are Dreadzone organisers of the sport of the same name and it's a TV show. They also supply the weapons and armour to the heroes, which is nice of them I guess? Number 59. The main antagonist is Gleeman Vox, who happens to be in charge of the Dreadzone. He's the one responsible for the kidnapping and killing of the heroes involved in the show and sport. Oh, and he owns all the stuff that's named Vox, including airways, pharmaceuticals, space and casino resorts, and loads more. Number 60. Next up, Insomniac released Ratchet & Clank Tools of Destruction, which was also called Ratchet & Clank Future in Japan. 
It was released in October or November of 2007, depending on where you live on the planet, and was the first game to be released on the PS3. Ooh, future indeed. Number 61. This game sees our favourite double act travel to the Polaris Galaxy to defeat the Emperor Percival Tachyon, who wants to learn the Lombax secret and kill the last surviving one, which if you've been paying attention, you'll know is Ratchet. Number 62. Emperor Tachyon is the self-declared prince of the Kragmite species, who battled the Lombaxes way, way back before the first Ratchet & Clank game, and were defeated and sent to a different dimension using the Lombax secret, or Dimensionator. Number 63. This game also sees Clank learn more about his past with the Zoni. The invisible race guide him, and in this game, Clank has his own gameplay sections that allow him to use the Zoni to complete tasks. Nintendo 64. Tools of Destruction also sees Ratchet get a girlfriend. Ooh. Her name is Talwin Apogee, and she's a Marcasian who you end up finding on the Apogee space station. She knows loads about Lombaxes, which is super helpful, and also aids Ratchet in his search for Clank. Number 65. Oh yeah, at the end of the game, once you've defeated Tachyon and gone back to the space station to celebrate with Clank, Talwin, Pirate, Rusty, Pete and Quark, because yep, he's back, Clank gets abducted by the Zoni. Number 66. And that takes us to Ratchet & Clank Quest for Booty, or Ratchet & Clank Future Gaiden, Kaizoku Darkwater no Hiho in Japan. Wow, that's a different title. Clearly they weren't ready for this jelly. This second installment of the Future Trilogy was released in August of 2008 for the PS3. Number 67. It picks up straight after the kidnap of Clank in Tools of Destruction and sees Ratchet and Talwin travel from planet to planet to find Clank, whilst encountering space pirates, a supercomputer and an obsidian eye, which they can use to help find him. Number 68. The big difference in this game is that you don't have Clank, obviously. Instead, Ratchet has the OmniWrench Millennium 12, which contains a kinetic tether to move and manipulate objects around him. Number 69. Quest for Booty. It's a much shorter game than some of the others and ends in another cliffhanger, with Clank being told that the Doctor is coming to fix him and in walks Dr. Nefarious. Dun dun dun. Honestly never knew they had this deeper lore. Number 70. Which brings us to Ratchet & Clank A Crack in Time, the third and final part of the Future Trilogy. Released in October and November of 2009 on the PlayStation 3, it picks up once again from the cliffhanger of the previous game, with Ratchet looking for the captured Clank. Number 71. Ratchet is helped by Quark, yes, again, to find Clank. Dr. Nefarious, who's got Clank held hostage, is pretending to fix him for the Zoni, but he's actually trying to get hold of the Great Clock, so he can control time. Number 72. The Great Clock was created by the Zoni and is right at the centre of the universe. Orvis from the first game created it in order to maintain temporal normality in the universe. Orvis wanted the clock to be left in Clank's care before the Zoni damaged him. Number 73. To cut a long story short, Ratchet rescues Clank, duh, and whilst Clank was supposed to remain with the Great Clock as its caretaker, his journey with the Zoni taught him about family, so he leaves with Ratchet, promoting Sigmund to senior caretaker of the clock. Number 74. Before the game was released, Insomniac held a weapons contest where fans sent in their craziest weapon designs, and the winner's weapon would be featured in a crack in time. Jason Finley won with his Spiral of Death, incredible name really, a rifle that shot a spinning blade which moves through the air, hitting multiple enemies before returning to the weapon. Number 75. The game was reviewed higher than its two trilogy predecessors, and was featured in a 2011 IGN list at number 23 at the top 25 PS3 games. Apparently, it's also reported to be the favourite Ratchet & Clank game amongst a lot of Insomniac employees. Number 76. In case you hadn't had enough of the future trilogy, in 2013 Ratchet & Clank Into the Nexus was released, which acted as an epilogue and was the last foray onto the PS3 for the duo. Number 77. It was slightly different to the rest of the Future Trilogy too, as, well, it was the fourth one, but also critics noted it was more of a return to the colourful and ridiculous over the other entries which were more, and it's weird to say this about these two, but grounded and dark. Number 78. In 2016, Rainmaker Entertainment alongside Insomniac and Sony Entertainment released an animated movie based on the original game called, well, Ratchet and Clank, and also released a remake of the original game alongside it to be played on the PlayStation 4. Number 79. Well, it was packed to the gills with voice talents, including Paul G. Matty, John Goodman, and even Sylvester Stallone. But despite this, was a bit of a critical glove bomb, with 21% on Rotten Tomatoes, and made a $5 million loss. Number 80. But let's not forget that Ratchet & Clank have been very successful in the gaming world at least. That's why they've got heaps of spin-offs. 2007, for instance, saw Ratchet & Clank make their debut on the PlayStation Portable, with Ratchet & Clank Size Matters. <laughs> It wasn't developed by Insomniac Games. Record scratch, am I right? Number 81. 
Instead, Science Matters was put together by the good people over at High Impact Games, which was made up of many former members of Insomniac. So that record scratch may have been a little bit dramatic, sorry. Number 82. The game sees the duo taking it easy on holiday before a girl they meet, Luna, is abducted by a band of aliens known as the Technomites, who are apparently the creators of all advanced tech in the galaxy, but everything isn't as it seems. Ooh. Number 83. Science Matters introduced a new armor system to the game, with different armors being combined to provide an array of defensive bonuses, as well as a shrink ray, which is used to enter certain areas. It's called Science Matters, guys, come on. And not for any other reason. Head out the gutter, thank you. Number 84. In 2008, just a year after making their first appearance on the PSP, Ratchet and Clank were again at it with Secret Agent Clank, again developed by High Impact Games. Well, I say Ratchet and Clank, but really I just mean Clank, since it's only his name in the title and he's the main protagonist in the game. Number 85. You see, at the start, Ratchet is framed for a crime he didn't commit and is thrown in prison, so Clank, doing his best James Bond impression, sets out to prove his friend's innocence armed with a tuxedo and a load of gadgets, including a tyre rang, a bladed boomerang disguised as a bow tie, and a cufflink bomb. Number 86. Time for another spin-off now, with Ratchet and Clank All for One, which was released in 2011 on the PS3 and 2015 on the PS4. It sold 1.5 million copies. All for One didn't focus on single-player gameplay like most RNC games did, oh no. This was a fully-fledged multiplayer first experience with online and couch co-op. Number 87. That's why it's called All for One, by the way. That, however, was just one of many titles considered for the game. Other options included Bros Before Foes, Four Play, and Multiple Organisms. I see what they did there. That's f oh, that's filth, isn't it? Number 88. The use of the phrase whoop-ass spoken in the game caused a bit of controversy, seeing the game get bumped from a 7 plus to a 12 plus age rating in Europe. The phrase was subsequently patched out. Number 89. During development, the cake test was implemented to make sure multiplayer gameplay never got boring for any of the four players. The design ethos stands for co-op, active for all players, kinetic and easy to understand. Cake. Number 90. Along came Ratchet and Clank Full Frontal Assault, or Q4s, in 2012 on the PS3 and in 2013 on the PS Vita. Remember those? Man, I didn't have one either. Released to coincide with the 10th anniversary of the franchise, this spin-off came with tower defense mechanics, apparently drawing inspiration from other titles like Dungeons Defenders and Orcs Must Die. Number 21. The main antagonist is Stuart Zergo, a fanboy of Captain Quark, who apparently used to write really disturbing fanfiction about his hero. Anywho, Zergo launches his dastardly attacks because he's fed up of Quark letting him down so much. Number 92. The game's soundtrack features I Am Glad Because I'm Finally Returning Back Home by Edward Kiel, or as me and you know it, the Trollololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololol
The new Enforcer, for example, will only fire one barrel if the trigger is pushed gently and gives both if it's held down completely. Number 101. Plot-wise, the Dimension Hopping Alternative Reality Spinning Adventure game is caused by the Dimensionator, which goes haywire and basically cocks up space-time, which, in my experience, is never ideal. The game is out very soon indeed, and I for one can't wait. So those were 101 facts about Ratchet and Clank. Which gadget or weapon was your favourite? I can't believe we didn't have time to really go through them all. There's so many games. Let me know in the comments down below. Be sure to give this video a like while you're down there. And hey, why not subscribe? Nearly at 600,000 now. I've been saying that for a while, but you know, the more people subscribe, the less I'll have to say it. In the meantime, though, look at these two videos on screen. You're going to absolutely love them, I promise you. Why not give it a click and prove me right, and I'll see you there. Goodbye now.